Hello, faithful viewer. My name is Julie Gardner and I'm the executive producer of The Next Doctor. And I'm Russell T Davis and I'm the writer of this episode. And it's just the two of us. We've been left alone. Cut to drift, Russell. It has to be said at one point David Tennant was planning to do this podcast, but is sadly... Ill. Ill. So bless him. Get well soon, because I like to think of him. Bless, bless you, David. We're missing you. Though there is more space on the sofa. <laughs> so, Russell, here yes. we are. You wrote this episode. Why did you decide to go Victorian on it? I just thought it was about time. I thought we'd done a lot of present day uh, episodes, plus Titanic was sort of spaceship slash uh, present day. And uh, actually, no, I'm talking nonsense really. I didn't think that at all. It all comes from the Doctor, from the next Doctor, from his character. I mean, he just wouldn't have worked in the present day. Mm. He'd have gone to a Doctor. Because he's more of an old fashioned Doctor, isn't he? Well, yeah, that, that, that then all sort of accumulates. It sort of accretes in a way because then you sort of think, oh, we should dress a bit like William Hartnell or Patrick Troughton and he should have a frock coat and he should have also that more old fashioned doctorist type language. So actually, it came from the doctor. It came from, it wouldn't work in a futuristic setting as well. You know, in any setting actually where he would have just gone to the doctor and said, I've had a frightful experience. Make me yeah. better, please. So, yeah. um,. It sort of stems from that, really. And then, then you know, you make up lies in interviews. <laughs> we do interviews beforehand. You say, yes, Victoria never fits the, fits, fits the programme very well. But actually, it's from the character of Jackson Lake. Oh, and how long had you been thinking about this story? Oh, I don't know. Um, when did I first mention it to you? Um, a while. Um, mm. A year, a year and a half. It's like, we always sort of... I don't know. When did I first start talking about this? I couldn't tell you. But there's David Mosey. Hooray. Oh, what a marvellous man. And that's when it really came alive, actually, when we cast him, and that was just um, exciting. Well, because the press have often talked about David Morrissey as a potential doctor. So it's very good. He might yet be. He might yet be. We cannot rule anything out. Look but he they, fits, doesn't he? They both look at each other there. I love it's that. It's lovely. Bit. It's the comic timing that is great. Yeah, so once we had him in place, it all sort of slotted mm. into place, really. It's like, when did I first start thinking about this? I couldn't... Oh, you just can't pin that sort of thing down. I well, you were doing so much writing because this was the last thing you wrote at the end of season four, wasn't it? Yes. Because we, we had to film this. Uh, just uh, Normally we would film a Christmas special in July, but our schedule was different. So we had to film this at the end of season four. So we did so 15 we, episodes in a row. Oh, God. That I wouldn't it was do Titanic, again. Titanic, wasn't it? <laughs> What an effort that was. We went from Voyage of the Damned all the way through to this, which was a long It was shoot. really hard. And this was an hour-long special, and Journey's End had turned out to be 65 minutes long. So that had extended the shoot as well. So it was like, oh, blimey. No, it was tough. The crew by this point were hanging on by threads, weren't they? It was very tiring. Yeah, but which doesn't show. brilliant work. Listen. No, absolutely. But there's something about a Christmas special, isn't it? You just kind of rev up. It's exciting. Yeah. Yes, you need... Well, you need stuff like this look, like being dragged up walls and... It's just a nice start, and snow, really. snow machines. Snow, compulsory. Wait till... How many snow machines we're going to need next Christmas? That's like... Are you, are you threatening... You're threatening me already. The budget, oh. I can feel it now. Oh, my word. So lots of snow. We should buy some snow machines, stop hiring them, and we'll be in profit, frankly. That's the way to do it. <laughs> I've worked it out. I saved the budget. Hooray. Oh, I love a snow machine. And a Here they machine. Are. And look, and you wonder why David's got a bad back. I feel entirely responsible. What do you see this stuff? It's the hanging off the rope. My God, how many times have we done this to him? It's like... Well, he's such a physical actor and he loves doing all of this, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. All right, let's blame him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> look at that. Off he goes. And you see, this is why I never go on set, because look at this. It's just balmy. It's so balmy. So they're on little skateboards, aren't they, for they're this? They're on little... little like, there like... was actually... Do you remember there was like... Not an argument, but like quite a debate at the tone meeting as to who would make their seats. Yes. The little pads that they're sitting on because Neil thought it could be him, Danny Hargreaves thought it could be him, and there was like, there was a turf war over who's going to do the saddles. Because they are on saddles being pulled along by a quad bike. Yes, the yeah. quad bike, the faithful quad bike. But like I was saying, that's why I never go on set, because we sit in a tone meeting, they say, right, we'll wire them up, we'll put them along with a quad bike. And then, it was only the other day I watched, it's, this is just before Christmas, we're recording this, so it was the only other day I saw the Doctor, Doctor Who Confidential, Confidential to mm. sign off on that, and you see them with a quad bike being pulled across a warehouse, and you think, my It's God. balmy. If I knew half of what went on, I just wouldn't write it. They'd all sit and talk quietly. 
Aww. I wanted to keep an eye on this burning breeze. Yeah, it crops up quite a lot. Through, I think it's the secret enemy of the Doctor throughout this episode. Wherever you go, it's turning up. There's a breeze here. <laughs> you watch it. It's like it's like a little sort of Dalek, I think, and it's following them around, plotting the death of <laughs> Queen Victoria. I'm quite sure. So, um, Russell, we are at the tone meeting stage of our next special. So we, we are. are prepping currently Easter. Which we start filming which you in will January. Now know, having seen this, is called Planet of the Dead. How exciting is that? Very what a exciting. great title. It's a good title, isn't it? It is a good title. And it's a good episode. It's marvellous. So, yes, we, we are Doctor Who, for us, is back in production. We start filming on Monday, the 19th of January. We've just got three Cardiff, specials. Cardiff City Council have agreed to do some extraordinary stuff for us, haven't they? It's, well, four specials, sorry, because of course the last one's a two parter, right? Yeah. And well, Cardiff City Council are amazing. We're not giving away dates, are we, for specials? Because no. it's like... No, but there's a lot of fuss online at the moment. Um, oh, um, is there? Um, yeah, that bloke, Laurie, alerted me to it. That um, People think that like the last two specials are going next Easter, so that Series 5 might be delayed till the autumn of 2010, which isn't no. being talked about at all. No, this is not what I'm only doing. bringing that up so because the sort of person listening to this podcast is the sort of person who worries about things like that. Don't and worry, fear not. Fear not. That's not the plan. Mind you, plans change, but that is seriously not happening because then Doctor Who would be off air for like two years or a year and a half mm, or something. No, so that's not happening. That's not what's going on. The rest of the specials... Will be earlier than that. Yes. Yeah. And that's all. That's all we can say because you don't want to tell ITV. They yes. line up, you know, a skating, dancing dog extravaganza. Mind exactly. You, I'd watch that. That'd well, I, I like a bit of skating. <laughs> Though you were invited on to one of those shows once, Let's weren't you? Let's not even. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> Let's draw a veil and move on and look at the marvellous. I could talk about that story forever. Doctor. It's very hard to watch this because when you know what those flashbacks are, I can see the sun every time. Yes. You know the little boy over the shoulder, because yeah, and and I keep sitting there thinking, "Oh, we've given it away," but of course it's just a we blot. haven't. It's no, just we a haven't blur. at all. So the whole point of this is that it's funny this because we have been merciless in our and irresponsible in our in our pre publicity in sort of saying, "Is he the next Doctor? Is he the next Doctor?" Mm. Because of course he isn't, and I think I think the whole point of this is that you you get that very early on. You know, I don't think you're seriously sitting there thinking, is he the Doctor? I think by this stage, and you've listened to him, you're thinking, how there's does a he mystery. think? You're there's thinking a mystery. There's a mystery. Yeah, but you're thinking, how does he think he's the Doctor? Because mm. that's really what it's about. So you can't sell that in one line. And a title like The Next Doctor, and a tag, a catch, a hook, like The Next Doctor gets people to watch, which is why we're here. But... um this was originally the first scene after the it pre-titles. Was, and we moved it. It's funny because sometimes you watch this episode and you think, we should have held the Cybermen off until that attack in the graveyard. But you just want... I think it's Christmas. I think you want a little shark attack earlier. Hot cyber action early on. You do. And did you always know you were going to bring the Cybermen back into this? Once you, once you had the thought about the next Doctor storyline, was it going to be the Cybermen? Or yeah, because you... I think also I sort of say that the Victorian stuff came from the next Doctor. And yet, you know, you're never thinking any one thing. You're thinking 27 billion things all at once. And at the same time, I'd always been thinking how good Cybermen in a Victorian age would be. And at the same time, I've always mentally associated the Cybermen with snow because their very first story back in 1966, they appeared through the snow yeah. in, a, in a story called The Tenth Planet, which looks brilliant. It's a really beautiful story. So in my mind, they sort of go with the snow. So I automatically, it all just linked. So yeah. with hindsight, you put these links together. At the time, it's just instinct. Mm. Hindsight, when you're going to do things like podcasts and interviews. Then you sort of make the links afterwards, but at the time it's just. So we've all... just horribly talked over Dervla Kerwin's first scene. I'm sorry. She is so spectacular. I mean, we'd worked oh. with her before on Casanova, and she's one of I think the great actresses in uh, in the UK. And I think she just ate up this part. She was pitch perfect. I think she's she fantastic. She just knew how to hit the villainy, and it's such a complex. I'd love Vel there as well. We just got oh, a great cast. It's playing like... Rosita, how marvelous. And Rosita, which was meant to be a sort of Rose Martha combination of a name, just so that she'd feel like a companion even before she's done anything. Yeah, yeah. Because you see, it's this scene. I mean, look, we're only nine minutes in now. We've got a clock in front of us. We're nine minutes in, and this is where you play the sonic screwdriver gag. Yes. There it is. 
So you're giving it away. So you're in, right, from that point You're starting on, to answer the mystery. If you've had any doubt, that's like going, he's not a doctor, he's not a time lord, but... But he's not lying. He's not a con man. He's not a <laughs> trickster. He's, he's not actually a fraud because he believes it. So that's the mystery. It's hard, Now, isn't it? this was a scene that we shot very early in the schedule. We didn't and like this scene. Andy Goddard, director, did a very fine job. Susan oh, yeah. Hager, producer. We really didn't like the scene, and I still have problems with it. It's very... It's, it's very, dark. It's very nine o'clock drama, this And scene. it's a bit grim and a bit what I always describe in the rushes as a bit brown. And we were using smoke inside, weren't we? Well, it's not that what that gets it to me. It's this oh, the slightly... Smoke it's the, the slightly handheld close-up camera that gets yes. to me. It's insta- it somehow just gives something a more adult feel. There's a more unsettled feel to it. And I know what Andy's doing. And Andy's brilliant. Like everything else yeah, absolutely. in this episode we love. And we've said this to him as well. Um, but it was the one part. It was and it was the first day shooting, so we sort of went, "Oh God, you've been doing torturewood," and actually we forgot to say we don't like things shot like this. And I think also on this, we did make a surprising mistake with the design, which was all probably motivated because it's a, they're in a dead man's house. Yeah, so it's all a little bit kind of bleak and cold and shuttered off, and actually yeah. you don't really want that at Christmas in Doctor Who. And I sort of think it's also neither here nor there. We had a lot of trouble finding this house because it needed the stairs yes. and all that sort of stuff. Because actually, I'd always, as a reverence house, I'd always sort of seen it as very wood panel, even more Victorian in a way. But actually, it's quite light. Yeah. So we've darkened the light room, which isn't quite the same as a dark room that has, you know, shafts of sunlight coming through the curtains and things like that. In other words, we're never happy. And actually, everyone's done a lovely job on it. But it doesn't work the same for me. But it's funny, we've actually trimmed down a lot of dialogue in here. Mm. There was like, there was that joke about the children's charities that went. Yeah. There was a very funny joke about, well, it wasn't very funny, but it was like a joke about um, he worked for children's charities. Yep. And the doctor said something like, oh, how marvellous, what a good man. And he'd say, oh, yes, he'd beat them mercilessly. <laughs> mm. It was quite funny. But we, I laughed. Julie didn't. You know, I didn't laugh there. He Story said, I can't of my laugh life. in this scene at all. No. But we've trimmed that. There was actually another scene before they walk into this room. There was a scene in the hall. Yes, there was. Of course, the I'd forgotten that. The doctor decides to be Jackson Lake's companion, and we just sat there. Poor scene. We just sat there going, cut it down, cut it down, get out of this house. Not out of this house, get to the side men behind the door as fast as you can. Because. The image just doesn't feel quite Doctor Who. It no, feels a bit and... milky and a bit cold and a bit brown. And at the best. And at the same time, it's one of the tricky seats because it's two men talking. I yes. can't help thinking that if you're eight years old... You want to get off it. I think my worry in general about this special is if you're eight years old, you're going to go, oh, that's a bit talky. It's a bit like I was when I was in school. I think I was eight or something or nine Yeah. when John Pertwee's first season went out, which when you look at now is a marvellous season. But as a kid, I sat there going, people are just sitting in rooms talking because it's a lot more adult season. There's, there's a lot of politicians in it. And yeah. He's stranded on Earth and... There's a lot more earthbound enemies and politicians come in and units there and soldiers tell the doctor what to do. It's great stuff when you're watching out. When I was a kid, me and my mate Kerry down the road and Stephen, we used to sit there, sit there in the street saying, Doctor Who's not the same, it's all men talking. Oh. <laughs> so I've got a sort of memory of that here. It's like there's long conversations between the Doctor and Jackson Lake. But then balanced by a flash of a Cyberman, and of wow. course we do know the Cyberman's about to kick the door down. Yes. That is a saving grace. But to by getting through the scene was the right thing. And these two are acting their hearts out. It's a lovely yeah, scene. Yeah, it's lovely. We're just picky. Because uh, actually, to be honest, I think in the grade and in the edit, I actually think we've probably solved the problems with this scene, but we can't find I the can't, problems. I can't move on from it. I still... Move I on, still Julie. Feel, I, no, I'm stuck. Julie's I'm 2009 there. soon. No. Move on, love. No, I'm in the Victorian period. I'm leaving you behind. Well, I'm there. Goodbye forever. If only I could have a dress like Miss Hartigan. Who said that? I don't know. <laughs> you hear voices. <laughs> oh, oh Lord. Lord. Imagine Lord. Phil Collison watching this going, well, I would never have shot that room like that. <laughs> I know. That's going to be so... It. So I invited Russell, news from the front line. Oh. I invited Phil to our screening. Phil who? Phil Collinson. Oh, yeah. And remember him. And <laughs> he doesn't want to come. Oh, because he wants to watch it on he Christmas Day. He wants the whole experience on Christmas Day with his family, having his tea, watching Doctor Who. He says that. He says that. You mean you think he's got a date somewhere else? No, I think he's forgotten us. Oh, I think there he's, we he'll are. be watching Blake 7 videos and things. <laughs> Lovely bit of business with the umbrella here, completely improvised Great by Mr. Timing. David Tennant. And Andy Goddard, they yes. put that together. I love that bit. And the fight up the staircase. Yep. 
I thought cutlasses were bigger cutlasses, than that. Cutlasses, we had this problem. That is technically a cutlass, but I'd imagine more of a pirate you know, with a like big a handle. You pirate scythe yes. sort of thing, yes. That'll teach us to doze through those tone meetings, you see. Well, I've got to wake up for the <laughs> next specials. <laughs> the cutlass was all wrong. I'd like to complain. But And sparks added by the mill, thank you very much. Yes. For the contact with the uh, Cybermen and the sword. <laughs> I remember sort of having to save money at this point because it was like, while I was writing it, you never even saw it, but all of this was actually meant to be across the rooftops. You know, like oh, a sort of chim- nice. chimney chase. Like they would have been at you know, the rooftops at oh, and that the evening was setting and sliding down the gutters and the tiles and things like that. And the cyber shades would have joined oh. in and it became two side men on a flight of stairs just because... I mean, we'd never have shot it. We'd never have done it. Well, and there's quite a big set piece coming up at the end. Yes, there's three, four, well, there's, five there's set the pieces There's the graveyard, up, but so. there's the massive. And we cut a bit here because, um, because although we know the mystery is obvious, although, it, although, although we know that the mystery isn't the mystery that you think it is, here the Doctor got out his... Oh, he gets out his stethoscope anyway, but then they had some dialogue about it. What was it? Oh, I know. Oh, but he yes. listened to both hearts, and there is only one heart. And he and actually said, said, said your, your single heart. He said something like, you've got a good heart. Mm. Doctor, your single heart. They just sort of said, look, that's definitely not a Time Lord. Why I'm, I'm still interested in that. Well, we took it out because we wanted to wait for his big reveal, his big speech in the stable. Yeah. Where he, he tells him the whole story. Yeah. I'm st- I'm still think it's horses for courses because we've had uh-huh. the sonic screwdriver moment. Yeah. We kind of know he's not the doctor. So you kind of are still watching that moment knowing he's only listening to one heart. Right. So oh, I, I, th- I think it could have played either way. You just mean it didn't need spelling out? Yeah. We must have discussed this at the time. Well, we did. Because we edited this a million months ago. Normally, when we come to a podcast, we're sort of right on top of them. We've just finished it a few weeks mm. ago. Although we have just finished this a few weeks ago, but the edit was ages ago. Now, how spectacular does she look? Amazing. This is one of my most favourite scenes of anything we've shot in Doctor Louise Who. Page on that dress. And Beautiful work. How many discussions about the colour red were there? Scarlet red? Felt pen red? I... Bright red? Chair blue? All of that? <laughs> Everything. Chair blue is an ongoing discussion. <laughs> it's, it's like a deep... Oh, no, it's my phone ringing. Oh, no, it's my phone. Oh, oh I'd be so shocked. I, we keep talking. I like the fact that this is, shows what busy people we are. Is it anyone interesting? Um, it's a Dr. call. Hoopy Actually, it's a call about Merlin. So I must turn it off. Wow. Don't speak the word. Yes. I love that show. Uh, another Saturday night show. Oh, it's great. Is it coming back? I hope it is, yes. Hooray. Anyway, back to this. Now, this is an impeccably directed scene. Yeah. And it's a big set. Look at the size of the place there to snow up. And where are we? I don't know where we are. We are, are in this. a graveyard in Newport. It's in Woolloo's Cemetery. So did they go in and dig a grave? Uh, we did. Ooh. Is that like a spare plot? It is. And we, you know, we got all the permissions for the bits that we were using and where we were It's a we spare putting... plot like in the old bit. Yes. That's interesting. And I mean, here they come. Oh, here they come. How difficult was this to film? I mean, look, they can't see. They're in a mist, they're in snow. What I love about this scene is that it's without hope because the Doctor isn't there. The Doctor doesn't even know this is going on, which is quite unusual Absolutely. for Doctor Who. It's There's no rescue plan. No, yeah, normally he, you'd intercut with him leaping on the back of a horse. I remember writing it thinking they could go for the Reverend Rain Ranch and they could say... If they were after the Reverend, maybe something's going to happen at his funeral. So there was a choice to have had the two doctors galloping. To the, I remember being quite obsessed with the two of them on horses about what a brilliant image that would be. Mm. And so they could have galloped to the rescue and, and you know, and caught a glimpse of Miss Hartigan at the end or had some sort of little face off with her. But then I remember thinking, it's really strong if it's nothing to do with the doctor at all, that they're just slaughtered, actually. A Christmas Day slaughter, how marvellous. How much do you think that is governed by the mood you're in while you're writing? I That is a choice, because that's hugely. a bit more adult, isn't it? Yeah, but then I think, I don't think it's so much governed, I think my mood comes from what sort of story it is. Yes. Because you're actually telling a story about, the real story is about a mental fugue, a fugue state that mm. Jackson Lake, that I've always wanted to write about, that, that is a genuine medical condition, quite a rare condition. And quite a debated condition, yeah. actually. But to, to a certain extent, it does exist. And um, and it's a fascinating thing to write about. So once once that's your keynote, 
then actually you're in quite a serious area. And actually he's, he's in that state because his wife was murdered and he thinks his son is dead. And so he's, his mind's literally just run away. So once you're there, you're not going to throw Slovene in, are you? No. You know, or you're not going to do a gridlock with talking cats. Yeah. So it's, it is my mood, and I think also a more serious mood is the mood that comes after 15 episodes. episodes and what absolutely. I mean is that a more serious mood, it's more energy and more exhausting to be lighter. Yes. Because that, the courage that you need to put gags in, to put the funnier creatures in, whether that's the Mox of Balhoun or Banaka Falata or Slavines or something, it's actually a bigger, deeper breath you have to take. Do you think that's More why um, lots of new writers write darker th- stuff? No, because in a way, they, I think that's a separate thing because they're full of energy, actually. It's, yeah. it's, it's new and it's untested. It's yeah. the most exciting thing in the world to them. So I think, and I know, I know the answer to that because I did that. I mm. think when, and you can do your whole career like this, but certainly when I came into drama, you think that comedy is comedy and drama is tragedy. Absolutely. That's not true. Tragedy okay. is tragedy. Drama is comedy and tragedy all in one, and mm. anything can happen. But certainly when you're starting out, you think that's literally... If it's you a separation. Sit, if you were to sit with, like, 18, 19 year olds coming up with scripts and things, they go, oh, there's a death and there's a murder and then there's an abortion and then she goes to the police and she's beaten up. You know, it's like these stories come pouring out and you're going, and is your life like that? <laughs> and they go, no, I have a laugh down the pub. And you're, like, going, but... So... <laughs> you know, where's that instinct come from? And it's an instinct to be serious. Yeah. So that's why it happens with younger writers. But I think when you're as old as the hills, like myself, even though I look impossibly beautiful, then... Um, Always so. Then you need <laughs> more strength to be lighter. And I, I remember I had a chicken pox as well. I had chicken pox. You were so ill. Well, I had chicken pox when I was writing this. And then I became bronchitis. All of which is making it sound marvellous. But actually, funnily enough, I'd already chosen the story, so everything, mm. none that... And I have to say, if if this was a sort of gridlock-type story, if I'd conceived this as, yeah. say, one of your futuristic romps, I would have found the energy. Do you know that's the truth? Is that yeah. I would have... You just do. When you need it, it comes and it's there. So, oh, that's my And that's phone. your phone ringing now. Really? That's my are they, boyfriend. Are they, phone, are they not phoning you about Merlin? No. Um, yes, they're phoning me saying... We need you. Julie won't answer the phone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like leaving the phone on. It gives us something to talk about. Poor Vel, upstaging her lovely moment. So I love this set where he lives and how random and makeshift his life is. Do you is. remember this was going to be a rail yard? It was. We had conniptions. We said no. Thanks. We said no. They found a beautiful it place. It would have looked amazing. It was a beautiful location, but it didn't fit. It was a shed. It didn't fit full the period of or. Locomotive. Full yes. Of genuine old steam trains. And they lived inside a steam train. And it was It just brilliant. felt too grand, didn't it? And yeah. Strange. And he just thought, why would he be building a balloon in his backyard when he could go chuff chuffing about on a train? It now, was like, I love the balloon. It's When I read amazing. this in the script, it was a joy. No, but look, I mean the real balloon. I think it looks yeah. real. I think... I mean, bless the mill. They're always trying to make things look real. But it looks so solid. The way that is it's a, a mill, CGI balloon. A CGI balloon. And well, the basket's ours. Oh, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's a basket hanging on a great big crane above this yard. And the balloon is completely recreated. The balloon is by the all mill. added on. And it's just gorgeous. <clears throat> it's this shot coming up now where they're looking up at it and like the ropes are banging against the side of it. There they are. Look. It's the well, it one. feels like it's got real weight and texture. Yeah. I think it's an extraordinary piece of work here. It's brilliant. Very I'm a bit heartbroken, to be honest, that what? the mill has what? never won any significant industry award for Doctor Who. Yes, that's true, do you know, and I'll tell you why, because we've discussed this often, because when in your award ceremonies awards for visual effects are given, they're given for something that looks the most real. And we're a spaceship, and alien be- planet, Jews of people show. sit there watching stuff and they'll watch a Cyber King and they'll watch a spaceship <coughs> and they'll watch a Lazarus monster and they'll go, well, that's fantasy. So they don't give any marks, they don't give any points. Whereas if something is unnoticeable and, and you know, whether it's the Grand Hotel or whether it's like the street one this year, won uh, the Visual Effects Awards for putting twins on screen, for simple split screening, which wasn't simple. They worked very hard at it. And I'm not begrudging anyone else their prize. Yes, I am. And But it's nothing in comparison with what the mill do. The but, scale of the ambition, the workload, the shots, the number of shots. The point is, the mill wasn't even nominated. It's extraordinary. For a visual effects award. The I can't bear it. wasn't nominated. And we don't get cross about that stuff often. But that and, when you look at, and when you look at that balloon and then you see everything else that's coming in this episode, it's absolutely profoundly gobsmacked. And you look back and you think these are the people a year ago who were making, in the same year were making the Titanic. 
I know. You know, it's the whole range. That's partly the problem with award ceremonies. I don't think people know is that you have to nominate a single episode to be judged. And as you sit on those panels, on, I've been on those juries, well, we bastard have, yeah. juries, yeah. and if you, you, know, you watch episode one of something, and if you sit there and say, yes, well, episode three was really marvellous because she turned out to be a murderer, the chairman sits there and goes, no, we're just meant to be judging episode one. That's the only episode, which I think is completely wrong. Because, of course, you're judging the whole series. And, indeed, whenever a chairman does do that to me, I go, shut up, I'm talking. <laughs> and the point is, you're wrong. Mm. It's like they have to judge soaps on a single episode. It's just rubbish. So, now, getting back to this, why did you create the cyber shade? I like being on my high horse, like the cyber no, shade. No, I was like, I was enjoying your high horse. <laughs> but why, why the cyber shade in an episode with the Cybermen? I just wanted a variation, and um, and they need someone to do their dirty work for them. I didn't believe Cybermen could go clunking about. So, are they a cousin of the Cybermen? I... What's their lineage, do you reckon? Well, I, th- I think, person. Well, to be honest, the Doctor says they're probably cats or dogs. How much did you hate this flickering light, Julie? I really hate this flickering light. I think you're mad and obsessed about it. I did become obsessed by it, but if you re- once you notice it, it's very hard because you start to see a pattern to it. So you've now ruined it for everyone. Yes, I have. I thought so we regraded it to take the flicker off. We we couldn't really fix it. Ah. I mean, it's there. Obviously, everyone for candle flicker. But it's a mechanical device. And you it's, haven't ruined you it because I've heard you say rhythm. this and I've watched it since and I've forgotten your moans. There so. is a there is a there is a <laughs> candle flicker rhythm in this scene. <laughs> but that said, I absolutely love this scene. I think the performances are extraordinary. Oh, they're just lovely. And this moment, and the moment, my, well, you know, it was my favourite script moment where he says that's a lot of luggage. And you start to unfold. Oh, it's oh, the his wife. wife and the story. Yeah, I'm not sure I you love get that, that turning point. Moment somehow. Yeah. What, it's you bit, don't think we get it? Yeah, I think it's slightly undersold somehow. Whether, Just a little bit. Whether it needed a track in. But never mind that. Who cares about us talking about luggage? Have you seen what's coming up? Ladies and gentlemen... Oh. The Ten Doctors. And I'd just like to tell everyone here and now, this is Julie's idea, not mine. And I love it. But you said this... Was like, it? Yeah, have you forgotten? I've completely forgotten. The script said it was just images of the Doctor, the Tenth Doctor. Oh, and I wanted them all in. And then... Well, I think it cropped... I think someone at the tone meeting sort of said, who do you want as the Doctor? Do you want lots? I think someone asked the question, do you want lots of them? And you weighed in with, like, oh, that's brilliant. Christmas present for the fans, you said. Oh, I love have it. Have you forgotten you did that? I did. I have forgotten. Because I was like... I'm in my own fugue. I'm more wary. It's funny, because we... Test each other on fanish things like this. I'm very wary of being fan fanish. And I'm the so I test you on innocent. it. I say, do you think this is all right? And if you think it's fine, then it's fine. Because Julie's not viewer, such. I, yeah, but I'm getting worried that I've been taken to the dark side, <laughs> and I've been corrupted. So I, I'm pushing for increasing fandom things, and we can't reveal this. Do you know what a naimon is? No, you're not no on the idea. dark side. You're far from. It the sounds dark side. like a musical instrument. What is it? <laughs> if only it was. What it's is an a old naim- A naimon. It, it would move on. What was it? I have a mental fugue. I've forgotten. Okay. (laughs) But, of course, what we can't reveal, Russell, but we can tease, is we have had discussions (gasps) about the two-part climax to the specials. Well, then you know what the Naimon are. And there are things that we're doing in there that will reward for Oh, yeah, yeah. No, there's one thing that I sort of said to you. Do you think this is going too far with the planet of the Zarbi? It's marvellous. It's (laughs) marvellous. And you loved it, so... We'll see. It's not written yet. I might change my mind. So. I'm I'm clinging. <laughs> Cling on. Look at us laughing through this lovely scene. It's a beautiful scene. See, I was a slight problem here, and I thought Caroline, the dead wife, looks a bit like Miss Hartigan. She does a little bit. So I think there'll be some people out there going, right, so the Cybermen took his wife and changed her into the villain, and then they'll hug and kiss and reunite at the end. You're wrong. Well, it's a very good story in itself. We never noticed it until shoot it was all over, did we? No. It was... It was only right at the end you sort of went, oh, my God, they've both got... I, mean, I, th- he, I think... He does call her Caroline, and she said her first name is Mercy, so... Yes. I, I think few people will think that. I feel sorry for the one who does, though. Well, I feel to blame, because I should have spotted it. Well, it's the hair, isn't it, in the it's bun? the black hair. Yeah. If she'd been blonde, mm. I would have been happy. 
But she's in. She's black and white. How many different bells did we go through for this? Oh, the bells. There was, was one bell that sounded them? like a little tin box in the corner of the room. But that's our terrible sound department, of course. Well, some of the, whom are in the room with us now. They live in the dark. <laughs> Bless them. They're like oods. They work so hard. Oh, I anticipated the Caroline bit then. I thought we'd done it. Sorry. I'm out of sync with the episode now. Hello. But then you've all seen this before. And it's funny, this, because there's a, I think there's an interesting thing about this episode. Well, I'm interested. That um, writing a mystery is not my natural state. Do you know what I mean? Well, you, yes. It's, it's not... You're a reveal-as-you-go writer. I am. It's, it's, and it's, it's a different choice. It's, yes, I'd much rather sort of just say that's the story. But you it love isn't. a mystery as a viewer. Yeah, because I think what's interesting here is that actually... By the clock, 30 minutes of a 60-minute episode have passed, and it's exactly halfway through this story. Right here, as the Doctor starts running, we're into a, into a completely different story. Yeah. It's literally a turning point. And it slightly overlaps. We've still got the mystery of Jackson's son to come, and it's been overlapping the other way but by yes, introducing Pied Piper now, Miss we? Hartigan and the Cyber King and things like that. Nonetheless, I think there's a... If you were dividing this into two half-hour episodes, it's absolutely there. It's like, that is where things start changing and literally into a different story now. So it's like part of, some part of me thinks that if you're writing a mystery properly, it would have kept going all the way up to like the 50th minute, you know? So the reveal yeah. of him would be combined... Well, you know, reveal of Jackson Lake is combined with reveal of the Cyber King. But there's actually part of me that can't be bothered to sustain a mystery. Is that a terrible thing to say? That makes me sound lazy, and I'm never lazy. You're and I say, yeah, lazy. When I say can't be bothered, I mean, I don't believe it. I simply yeah. don't believe it for long enough. To sustain this sort of mystery, there's so many things... That, to sustain any sort of mystery, there are so many things that must not be said and must not be asked. And I just feel it starts to distort. But is that, is that a particular thing to an episode of Doctor Who, though? Is no. That, is that how the choice you've made as no, the I think lead it's anything. writer of Doctor Who? I think it's anything. How often do you watch the telly? You know, I can't bear watching telly half the time. You know those awful plots, plots that hinge on a mistake where someone's overheard someone having an oh, affair. Oh, terrible. And it turns out to be their sister. But those plots actually hinge on that person who did the overhearing never sitting down and saying, so what was that about? Who's that woman? Why were you but talking to her? But that said, I love, and you love, a kind of Miss Marple or Poirot mystery, don't you? You used to love the Out I of the I do. Christies. They don't depend on mistakes, though. That's, that's, oh. that's, a, that's a puzzle. That's, that's, a, oh, that's a different one mystery, in a way. I don't know. We missed then that marvellous shot of the cyber shade in the street, the one that stops the Doctor. That we reshot how many times? That we reshot a million times because it was that shot as, as just before Jed walks in with his hot pie saying, oh, they all want a good whipping, if you ask me. There's that shot of the cyber shade watching them and the original thought, shot of the cyber shade had him sitting on a wall. Do you remember? Oh, in I the do. street, he was like a parrot. He was like a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, oh, you can't transmit that. And so they went back and reshot it again, and it wasn't even madder, wasn't it? It was like he was like poking out from behind a window. <coughs> so actually, isn't that shot like an effect shot? It's a composite of a side yes, it saved is. head. It is with a very darkened background. Yeah, we were that hooting. saved us. I know we just couldn't get that right. It was funny. It was. It's worth saying this was such an extraordinarily tough shoot. Oh not, yeah. Not just because it came at the end, which obviously was difficult, but there was uh, children's hours. Yeah. A huge amount of night shoots. Just period so, shoots you know, are hard. Periods, because... so all the period dressing and the costumes take more time. Yeah. Um, the then we went. We had to film a lot of um, our exterior street scenes in Gloucester, and actually, I think as a production, we've got so used to how well Cardiff treats us or how used to us they are yeah so so people don't really take so much notice of us when we're filming in Cardiff and of course David Tennant and Doctor Who arriving in Gloucester became this enormous event I mean it was thrilling in some ways to see how enthusiastic people were oh it's gratifying yeah but when you're doing complicated shooting and we were being watched by hundreds and hundreds of people it was a thousand by one night it was a thousand people um, Wow. It's 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 it obviously slows us down. It actually, and we were genuinely getting phone calls from Susie, the producer, genuinely worried about the state of play, about how to shoot stuff, about, about angles, health and safety. Health and, and safety. Yeah. That was the greatest worry. It was a worry because you have to get the police into. You pay the police. There's like crash barriers and stuff like that. Seriously, 
you can't have anyone, any of those thousand people being hurt watching you. And that's, that actually sort of becomes our responsibility. And it becomes your focus on what is a complicated night shoot when the schedule is tough. And... Yeah. And you'd try not to shout the plot out for something that's not going yeah. to be shown for another nine months or something. So it was je- so Susie it was, was really Susie tough and Andy were amazing. They were, and um, it was a, and David and the cast. Oh, they yeah. they just they just keep going. But they were actually hard. They were cool as cucumbers. It was a very difficult shoot. It was. We're not blaming him of turning up because oh, it was lovely to see that got, When that eleventh Doctor, the poor soul, turns up, we're in some street. I'll be there. Wait, well, we will be there. We will. Wait, with a banner thing. I love you, Charlie Drake. <laughs> I will be there, frankly. So you can't blame anyone, but it's, you know, you can't just turn your back on the crowd. Actually, you literally have to make it safe, and it's a weird setup. Yeah, it was very hard, this this shoot. Tricky. But I know we sound quite picky today, don't we? I don't, I don't think we're being picky. I love this episode, and I can't oh, yeah. wait for people's reactions, and I'm incredibly proud of it, but I don't oh, think I we're being it. picky. I think it's coming at the end of a long day. We're Actually, doing this. to be honest, I think a podcast is more interesting when they're a bit picky. Yes, I think we're really reliving it and thinking about what we did. And Good, because it is lovely. I love it. it. Is. And here he comes now. Jackson Lake, turn into the hero. How marvellous. And our discussions that we have with Louise about... Oh, loads. Because he's got his coat. It's beautiful. And he's got another coat as well, hasn't he? So that coat was on, off, on, off. And, no, and then how many it. discussions did we have about Rosita's punch here? <laughs> and then there's a tiny trickle of blood, which is as far as we wanted to go. On I love article. that, though. Good girl, Rosita. I love that. We have, for an action-adventure series, we have a world-record low number of punches. Yes. Which is right. Oh, no, absolutely. It's very rarely physical violence in it. And that's why I like the doctor's line there. I think he means it when he says, I completely disapprove. <laughs> so now we're heading towards the climax. It's all shifting gears now. It's like you can hear it going, mm. we're into the end. We're yeah. into the final There's big chases. There's a pace now, things. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's a natural pace of adventure mm. now, now that the mystery's out of the way. It's funny, isn't it? The thing I love about when they've got a snow machine down, people complain about being cold. They always do that when you're filming in summer or like May or whatever it was. When did we film it? Um, it was then, wasn't it? It was April. April, end of the run. I can't remember. We've got yes, I think it was here. round about April. It's all blurring into one. I know. It's like we're just constantly filming. We've just come back. In fact, faithful viewer, from the edit of the first edit of Torchwood, Torchwood episode one, series three, episode one, which was marvelous. Brilliant. I loved it. Oh, my Lord, it was good. Very, very exciting. I wish I had it on DVD. I'd go home and watch it now. Do you know, so would I. I was. I loved it. So they're all back. Hooray, she kills the men. And she's... Everyone's... uh, Like that mental fugue thing, everyone's feeding off that because she is as dark a villain as you will ever have. And a lot of it isn't stated, but, you know, all those long conversations we had about... I had with Durfer as well about, actually, Mm. she's... A victim of abuse. She's broken. She's and then and she's also then part of the Victorian age. She's like she's a powerless woman who's been in servitude and far worse all her life. And I'm talking quite discreetly around this because because um, there are children listening and watching, and there's only so far you should go, and you should discover it as you get older. But um, it's a terrible backstory being that matron of that workhouse. The terrible things done to her and. And that's she's got this really twisted character where she sexualizes everything. She wears red. Mm. Everything's inflammatory with her. And in the end, she she becomes a man. She becomes a cyber king. Mm. It's like she has to go through this extraordinary process because she's so damaged. Poor Miss Hartigan. Now we should point out for the Hawkeye viewer that that glorious set where the children are working with the cogs and the wheels is the tortured hub redress. We should indeed. But the Hawkeye viewer will have read the Radio Times two weeks ago that told you that. Oh. <laughs> In an article written by Ben Cook. Oh. He gave away all our secrets. Did he really? I haven't read that yet. <laughs> yeah, it says oh, they're filming in the ben. hub. So, well, it's not a bad secret to give away. But a great design. I love the little bit of Dalek design on this Dimension Vault. It's like mm. it's like a tiny little bit of Dalek on Christmas Day as a present. Look, it could oh. almost be. It should have started moving. and Maybe it's a friend with that brazier. I've been forgetting to point out the brazier. But believe me, oh, the yes. it's been there. Faithful Brazier. This was tricky to describe, wasn't it? Because now it gets like a practical throne. This is complex. Oh, yeah, this was, you know, this was... The, the breakdown of the sequence the between CG and The bridge and the chair and the sideband and the, the alcove around them 
was all built in our warehouse. And that's the reverse shot, which is still the Torchwood hub. But everything else is the Cyber King surround. Everything else is a sometimes a 3D. When it moves, it's a 3D background. Sometimes it's 2D from different angles. It's like, oh, it starts to get complicated. Oh. And she's about to head to her doom. Except she's the salvation in the end, I suppose. Do you know, I forgot. Remember, that was one of the last bits of dialogue we put in because I forgot to ever say, you know, I forgot to explain to new viewers what Cybermen do. Yes. And no point to me ever actually said, oh, yeah, they convert people. I just took it as red. And there was a huge debate, wasn't there, about her helmet. Oh, my Lord. Her crown. <laughs> well, the original well, how helmet. How many times did we go through this? Bless it. And, like, thank God they emailed it to us like three days before they filmed. Because mm. the original helmet was like a Cyberman's head. It was like the Cyberwoman's head from Torchwood. Literally, it was a Cyberman's head on Dervla Coburn. And we just went, oh, my Lord, no. And and thank God they worked really hard and they had two days to do it in and they came up with this helmet. It is beautiful. You know, it's Victorian it's and fits the design and everything. But that was funny. And it, it should have looked like Dervla Coburn in a fancy dress. It was like she decided to go to a party as a Cyberman. So, <laughs> so here she, she is with her black contact lenses wow. and the mill helped get rid of any trace of white there. Yeah, those contact out. lenses don't quite go to the corner no. of the eye because that's a lot more expensive. That's why we did it. We did it to save money. But then we ended up spending that money yes. painting out the corners of her eye in post-production. <laughs> Which bit of the hub set is that where there's a little tunnel coming in? I've never seen this tunnel before. Do you know, I don't know what that bit maybe is. Maybe they built it for this or something. Or maybe it's a tunnel we've never used. Look at that. The machine. That's glorious. Gorgeous. And it's really getting into sort of like... I always think this is like children's film foundation territory now. You know, like children yes. sleeping away, locked or chitty chitty bang bang and oh, things like I that. Oh, those films. And it's those Christmassy things, isn't it? Mm. Of children being made into slaves and locked away. And I love what the those deaf sound boys have done with her voice now. That's good. Because we didn't do a that. A little originally. bit of treatment. Yeah, because we didn't have it originally, and it was just lacking something, wasn't it? Yeah. And then they went away and did that, and it's brilliant. These are the Torchwood. Yes, tunnels. Sewers, which have also been the sewers in Daleks in Manhattan. Yeah. What else have they been in? They were the fortune teller's room in oh, they Turn were. Left. Turn Left, they were. And Surely that's, <laughs> Surely that's it. Surely that's it. Are they the still sewers. there? We've still got the tunnel. Well, we're, you know, in in the state of redeploying things. We can't say any more. Oh, They're well, giving what do you secrets mean? away. Oh, what do you mean? I'm not I oh, we can't. Oh, tell me later. There's something else moving in. Well, we'd be giving away Torchwood. Oh, right, I see. Shh. Shh. Not a word. Listen to Miss Hartigan. Is Hartigan a real surname, or did I make that up? Have you ever I heard of a Hartigan? I think it's, it's, it's real, isn't it? I don't know. I was in school with a Harrigan, Michael Harrigan. Hartigan. Are you eating crisps? I'm eating a crisp. I can resist. <laughs> This is going to be broadcast on BBC Three. I'm Press sorry, we're button. 42 minutes and 55 seconds in and there is a bowl of crisps and I've avoided them for 42 minutes. I can't. That was like the crunchiest crisp in the world. <laughs> I did eat the smallest one, though. <laughs> now we're into action. Run out we're of that Torchwood so Tunnel. Action. The Torchwood Tunnels don't really run into the Torchwood Hub. They are a separate set. And this is a separate studio across the way where this whole... We went into studio this day, do you remember? Oh, it was brilliant. We visited. We had a very rare visit for you and me, but we went and saw Dervla. It was so lovely. So lovely and so poised in that red dress. Yeah. Well, it must have been uncomfortable as well with the oh, black contact so lenses. so uncomfortable. In. But not a complaint. Never mind about the contact lenses, the bone dress. <laughs> you ladies Try understand your dress is better. a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, we oh. go. The freedom of the children. What could be more doctorish? No, this is well. It's very chitty chitty bang bang. It's very Christmassy, isn't it? This whole thing. yes. And there's that. What's that city of lost children thing? I've never seen that, but I imagine no, it's I very haven't. much like this with waifs running through chains and things. Don't you? Yes. Yes. And now, of course, we're I building up. To I think the that's sun. the only shot where you can see it's the hub. I wish we hadn't done that shot actually. Do you? Yeah, I just think that looks absolutely like the Torchwood Hub. It's that bit yes. in the middle, of hot yeah. house boardroom level that sticks out. On a diagonal, I just think, oh, it's the hub. Now, Russell, we're about to get into the Cyber King. My Lord above, the mill <laughs> did amazing work here. Oh, astonishing. And kept going. Just more shots kept materialising. I think, and it took, it took 
well, if the marvellous thing about this was it sort of had all year to gestate and render. Um, so the Cyber King is beautiful. The mill all went off to work on Merlin and then came back, actually. So we left this episode for a long time, didn't we? We did. We came back, and actually we came back and re-edited yeah, it. This is bits. a rare slow-mo motion, moment for you, because you yes. need slow-mo. I, for faithful of you, love it. I think the script said slow motion, I'm sure Well, that's a mirror. You must have been feverish, which I you know. Helps. Yes, I was ill. I do normally hate slow motion, but it's justified. Here it's like, look, he's it's thinking. Huge. It's huge. It's the, the cogs of, of his mind, it's absolutely. It's all because it's the mental fugue. Breaking. Unfuging, I think, is the musical term. <laughs> Oh, I know this is. Yeah, you have a crisp while I talk about the cutest child ever. He's brilliant, isn't he? He is like it's like rescuing the Andrix puppy. He's <laughs> so beautiful. No, he's a great actor. He's excellent. His face. Tom Langford. Look at him. He's absolutely delightful. But he now here we have Knights of the Realm. David Tennant, and David Morrissey. And from this point on, they're upstaged by a child. I know. He's so cute. It's like. He's so cute. He's just perfect. And it's funny when you see him on. Um, I didn't actually meet him, and when you see him on Confidential, he's as Welsh as can be. Is he? He's brilliantly Welsh. Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm a Doctor Who, <laughs> like that. Oh, here we go. So that's that's the camera actually craning down while the surround is CG Simon. Oh, it's too complicated to oh, explain. I, I can't be bothered. You know, green screen, CG, blah 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 blah. Oh, this took a lot of hassle oh, as well, no, didn't it? Oh, this was a lot of work. We, we had to we had to change the that should speed it up this. in the end, cause, yeah. which we just felt the wire work and then the CG backgrounds weren't quite working in sync. weren't quite were they? keying, were they? No, and, and that's a nightmare because when you go in and speed up a shot, it means we lost like half a second off the episode. Which actually is a nightmare, because the episode was locked very early in the year. We came in later in October, November, and did that. So everything's out of sync, all the track laying. And Murray the, Gold's music. The music score's all half a second out of sync, so everyone had to go back and do more work. But we needed to lose great. that half second. It was like... Oh, a lovely moment. Look at that. Hooray. A happy ending in the middle of the end of the world. This scene, do you remember, we almost cut. Yes. In fact, we did cut at one point, and then Andy Goddard said, that little girl... Stayed awake specially till five in the morning Aww. to shoot that scene. And I was a pushover. I just went, oh, well, we can't oh, cut she's it then. Lovely. Oh, she's lovely. She's lovely. And it does work. I know. It personalises the yeah. crowds. I wanted to get to the Cyber King earlier. Now, how marvellous was this? This. But do you remember when we first saw this shot? Oh, oh my. Because the mill had told us all the way along they couldn't do water. For years, and water said, is a nightmare. We'd have a, and that's, that shot I actually you saw then of the second effect shot of Dervlet and the Cybermen with water streaming down. They've got real water yes. streaming in front of them. But then the mill's gone and done all those cascading drops. That, they did as like a surprise for us, didn't they? Because they yeah. literally said to us, we can't do it. Now, what did Susie Liggett realise on the geography of London shouldn't be there? London Bridge or Tower Bridge? Yes, was they that, put in... Was it, was yes. it Tower Bridge? We sat so we had the, to remove it? We sat in the effects review for this, wowing, I did all, and then she went online, she quietly went online on her laptop and said, I hate to tell you this, but Tower Bridge did not exist in 1851. So the man, that nice, was it Simon, who'd done that, that match shot was hauled in in front of us? And I had to, I had to paint out the bridge. And was marvellously, bridge? marvellously, he said, well, I asked Dave Houghton what year it was, and Dave said the script didn't say. <laughs> Well, in the very first scene, they say it's 1851. So, Dave, we blame you entirely. We always blame you, Dave. I was hooting with laughter at that. Anyway, we're into Cyber King madness. This is extraordinary. I, we were coming to my favourite shot, which is the foot coming down. Oh, you just missed it. They just did oh, the I foot just missed down. it. Yeah, I did. I were, love that shot. You were looking at the crisps. But it's bonkers, isn't it? A great big Cyberman is striding all over Victoria. And London. then we're getting to the plucky balloon. <laughs> The plucky balloon. We get away with murder, though. Why isn't that in the history books? Well, we could we could do the alternative Doctor Who history, couldn't we? Well, exactly. A spaceship didn't fly into Big Ben in 2006, either. So, mm. there we go. The whole thing I is, believe it did. Well, maybe everyone was retconned by the soon-to-be-born torch or something. And there was a lot... Do you remember? There was a lot of work putting these camera shakes in because they had to work yes. out the sound department had to work out what the speed of the Cyber King was, so they had to wait for the mill, and then, which then had to go back to the mill for the actual shake on every footstep to be put on. And I think there were 50 million emails about that. Yeah, there were. In the end, I went, don't talk to me about the footsteps and the shaking. I love that shot. 
So do I. I love a camera move on some CG work. Because we always sort of said, I, the image I had in mind was that the Cybermen would look like teeth in the mouth. Mm. Which I'm not quite sure is true, but it does for me because I've got that in mind. And this is where the mill started giving us extra shots of the Cyber Because King. they loved it. And again, we had to alter the duration of the running time. God, we kept altering that running time, didn't well, we? Well, we we just kept... We enjoyed this episode too much. We just kept working on it. Yeah, and actually, when they offer you a free shot of a Cyber King like that... Who's going to turn it down? There's always a price to pay somewhere. But um, you can't turn it down. You've got to alter the duration and shove stuff in because it's just looking brilliant. I love these two together. The Doctor and I wish you'd funny. written more for Jed. Mm, I was, you know... He was going to have a little sort of relationship with Rosita, like he fancied her and she'd have nothing oh. to do with him. That's why you actually see them standing together at the end, like they're together, in my mind. Oh. I just never wrote it. Well, there wasn't room. Look, 60 minutes bang well, on this episode nice. is. I know. That's one of our extra Cyber King shots, the one you just saw. Mm. And this next one, that's extra. Extra. Bless the mill. I love this balloon. So that's David in a basket on a crane being lifted up there, obviously. And with a CGI balloon. And with the balloon. Later added in post. Added, but it just looks brilliant, doesn't it? I think that's one of the finest things we've done. And we had long, we had debates about that because when the balloon's going up, there isn't any camera shake on it because it wouldn't be shaking in midair. Mm. And yet, the, see how many emails there were? I'm going to stop talking about camera shake now. I'm going to say fruity things from now on. I can't think of anything fruity. Well... I mean, frankly, we're two weeks away from fil- from transmitting and you were still doing notes yesterday. I was? What was my final <coughs> note on this? Uh, it was a final mix note. I said my final note was Kit Peddler was spelt wrong at the very end credits. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, creator of the Cybermen. My inner fanboy was outraged. Turn, I love the way she does that. Do you know, this shot, this is, it's weird to say this, but... These effect shots are literally exactly as I imagined them. Are they? Because, you know, and, and I'm, I'm always delighted and well treated in this job because so much is exactly like you imagined it. But, I mean, literally the exact angle really? and the colour of the sky and the speed at which the Cyber King turns. That's why it's in two shots. Do you remember? We broke it down yes. into two shots because I talked about the weight of it and how it would swivel around like that while the balloon there. And they take my breath away, those shots, because that's literally like unusually like opening up my head and going yeah or like that advert we know with the back of their brain so is open. this is david tennant in the studio he's against the black yes, curtain exactly and she is in a completely different studio on a different day it might be the same studio for all i know probably not though is it no i don't think it was the same studio no so they are not just half a mile apart but weeks apart we did his very early on and yes. this was probably uh, Derva was probably the last stuff we did, I think, on yes, that it throne. Was, yeah, we were in on the on the last day. We always stood up at the end just to laugh at everyone. Yes. <laughs> well, that was also the end of of a ten month shoot, wasn't it? So yes, we were propping people up, <laughs> <laughs> or we were leaning on them because we needed propping up. Oh, we did. <laughs> and this all changed. This the script all the way up to the read through. We had the read through where he fired this at her and killed her, and then we had the read through, and I sort of went away. Most disturbed, thinking, well, he might as well have taken a gun. He might as well have taken a gun and shot her through the head. You know, you try and avoid... It's so much more moving, ...violence with the Doctor. Um, And it's so right for her, with her great mind, that can actually outwit the Cybermen. So i tell you a funny thing, which is the... Which is, no... Not going to be funny at all, is it? No, it's not funny. It's that, but you never stop rewriting things, ever. And and if there's anything... you're rewriting it now? Yeah, no, I thought of this the other day that, um, if anything, I still don't like that little handy dimension vault weapon that he crops up to get rid of the wreckage. Yeah. But I could never think of how to get rid of the wreckage without crushing London. And the other, about two days ago, as I was watching it and thinking, well, she should have destroyed the Cybermen when she screamed, when she's free. Yeah. But she's still in the chair. And then the Cyber King's about to fall and the Doctor calls out to her saying, save them, you know, the people below. So she makes oh. the Cyber King... I know! She... Oh, I know! So she makes the Cyber King disappear. No need for a silly Dalek continuum oh. dimension vault. What rubbish script editor you are. Oh, <laughs> I am a rubbish script editor. Isn't that, that better? That's so much better. So the final thing she does is save everyone That below. would have been lovely. Or was that a bit sentimental? It's Christmas Day! I know. Maybe I was aware of that, and now I say it, maybe I thought... Maybe you Oh, I'll save it. everyone is a bit sentimental. No, but I, I don't like. That, I don't like the. I'm sorry. I think that would have been glorious. Oh, have I ruined the episode for you? Yes. Oh well. Well, we... the ca- well the candle flicker's already done that. Well, on Christmas Day, Emmerdale is on, and someone falls to a frozen lake. Apparently. 
dear. So there we go. Jackson, that sounds, that sounds Jackson a, Lake or Frozen Lake? That sounds a bit grim. <laughs> That, I think that would be marvellous. There's a frozen lake on Emmerdale. There's a frozen lake on EastEnders. Isn't it funny? I love the way I'm still talking about your alternative end and you're trying to avoid it. I can't bear the fact there could be a better ending that we haven't transmitted, so it's too painful to look. Yes. So there. And actually, that's a lovely That's shot. lovely. Yes. All right, then. I like the Dimension Vault now. Now, of course, we're building up to London Town thanking the Doctor. Yes. And and I need to ask the mill to do that extra shot, which it I love, the top shot. A shot. As streets everyone's, and ringing bells. As everyone starts to clap now, there's a shot looking down at St Paul's from the balloon that Julie begged off the mill. Well, I'm sure we had to pay for it. We did pay for it. Uh, yes. But um, um, desperately. It was lacking, lacking scale. scale. It was like this lot clapped. And actually, this actually, we were seriously running out of time in Gloucester and we had been impacted on by the crowds watching and we did lose time and we did drop stuff so there were more you're meant to cut to another yes. street where everyone's clapping yeah. and, and we, we never did, got that we actually did start I'm not blaming crowds there but, you know it happens and anyway also, also even um, if we had got that's that that's the in the background well the constant is moved around yes um, even if we had got that extra street we still needed that top shot the scale because, because of what he says no one ever thanks him and you need to see the world thanking him for once yeah and it's the only time it happens actually yeah. and I don't think it'll happen Lay. that shot there we beg, stealed and borrowed for that and anyway, they have got there are the little people we are actually watching this in a dub on like a massive screen the, bigger than any television on earth so you can actually see little human beings in the streets Jumping and leaping and cartwheeling. Viewers at home will have to get their magnifying glasses. And the balloon, glasses out. the plucky balloon. The plucky balloon. The TARDIS tethered aerial release developed in style. I can't tell you how long that took to think of. I was sitting there going, the aerial romancer. <laughs> that just Aww. went on and on and on. Oh. I love so, this scene. I love seeing these two fine actors together. Because I know. the last time they were tangoing in Blackpool. <laughs> the last time they worked See, together. The, I think it was a happy little family downstairs in the lake household. They'll be Jed doing the, the chores. They'll be Rosita looking after Frederick. They'll be Frederick growing up to be a monster, probably. He's probably got a little side implant. But does Jackson Lake find love again? Never. Never. Sadly. That's a really sad Because he honours his wife. Actually, there was a lot of smallpox going around at the time. I didn't like to... Oh. Tell you I, about. I, reg- I reject the smallpox <laughs> just because you had chicken pox. I'm not going there. <laughs> Imagine saying that. Putting up a little caption saying, "Next year he died of smallpox." <laughs> <laughs> that would be brilliant. <clears throat> I think when I retire, which would be next year at this rate, I'm only <laughs> two weeks away from a new year. That I'll start. I'll write BBC books, right. and I'll do little novels, and I'll do a little novel here of these two men where they pop into the TARDIS. The door shut. Uh, no, they go in. They have this dialogue, and then uh, in the middle of one of Jackson's lines, you have you go off into adventure. Let me see another planet. He says, "Yeah." Off they go, and they have a complete missing adventure together. I would love this. That'd two be lovely. Together. So and then do they I. come all the way back, and the Doctor says something to Jackson, and Jackson goes, "No, no, 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 no," and runs out. So the, all the so all the continuity is intact. Do you know that's how much I think about these things? Yeah, but I'm horrified that you're saying this on a on a podcast because my phone is going to be ringing <laughs> as soon as this goes out saying when can Russell write that yeah wait till you see how much I'm charging no way <laughs> no way but bless them I'm glad we did that because they slightly almost slightly prolong these endings but you just can't resist you sort of think it's David Morrison it's he's lovely. in the TARDIS it's lovely the two of them together and the snow is coming down and it's we did Christmas. have to edit around quite a bit here because marvellously in the background there there are extras walking around going, I'm still very injured from a Cyberman's foot. Yes, <laughs> so and we're enjoying there this. Are, there are couples They're walking They're staggering, past. aren't they? There are people supporting each other and a man <laughs> staggering. And then he sits down and then he walks back the other way and we had to actually edit the entire thing around the injured extras <laughs> who were only doing what we told them to do, which was like, look like you've just been attacked by a Cyber King. But it's sort of distracting from the romance of the moment. <laughs> oh, it was funny. It were right funny. Oh, and look, the doctor's sad. Aww. David Tennant, we love you. We love you so much, and we miss you today on the sofa. Yes, we do, seriously. And Merry Christmas, David. Merry oh, Christmas me. to the two Davids. Yes, and they set off. We actually dropped the very last scene here because, not the very last lines, these two last lines they say, Merry Christmas, and it goes, Merry Christmas indeed, Doctor. 
that was actually on a completely different shot. It was a high shot of like the wrecked area and the snow was coming in, all the peasants were walking around being being Londoners and things like that. But it wasn't as good as this shot. Because this shot now is these... intimate. Yeah, this just more picture Fine. box, isn't it? It's like as you watch it, that's this shot here. As they walk off together, look, it's just really pretty and look, it's like a chocolate box. So we went for that one. Thank you, faithful viewer. Thank you, faithful viewer. This was brought and, to you uh, by the Doctor Who production team. It was. And Planet. we will return in the Planet of the, of the Dead. Which features someone called Christina. Planet of the Dead also features a character called Malcolm. Planet oh, of the I Dead also Malcolm. features Unit. We can say Un- that. Unit and Malcolm. Malcolm is great. Malcolm is going to be marvellous. He He's will have a spin off series. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.